Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to make one small correction. This is not Twitter's timeline service. This is actually Hadoop Yarn open source timeline service. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, because timeline is very familiar term with Twitter. So, um, so we're going to talk about the Hadoop's Yarn timeline service version two. Um, I just like to see a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with timeline service in Hadoop? Okay, about several, okay. Um, so let me talk about what that is first. Okay, I don't have a slide for that, but um, so timeline service is basically a way of storing many kinds of data, metrics, configuration, and things like that into a storage coming from Hadoop clusters or Yarn clusters so that we can use the data to do useful things. So we call that timeline service. Um, one good analogy would be, uh, if you're familiar with MapReduce, you might be familiar with uh, MapReduce's job history server. So if you go to a job history server, you can take a look at it. You can actually drill down into all the configuration, tasks, mappers and reducers, and counters, and all the fun things about your MapReduce um, applications. So timeline service is really an extension or a generalization of something like a job history server so that it actually covers not only MapReduce, but basically any type of framework that runs on top of Yarn. So that's the first motivation. And also second goal is really to kind of unify the view between a live application um, as well as completed application. If you look at job history server, that's strictly for completed applications, right? But if you are interested in finding out the same thing about a running application, what you do is actually you go to the RM UI, you drill down into it, and you actually go to the application master UI. But timeline service is really sort of trying to unify those things into two dimensions. One is between MapReduce and more general type of frameworks. And the second dimension is unifying things between running applications as well as completed applications. So it's really trying to cover all four uh, elements in the matrix. Um, so why is it important? Why, why is something like that important? And we can think of many reasons this, why this can be important. And there are three things I can think of at least. Uh, the first thing is basically, just imagine your applications like Hive or your Scalding or your PickJob. Usually they launch multiple, multiple Yarn applications. They do all kinds of very complex things. And you usually want to sort of visualize them in a kind of a waterfall type of visualization. And there's very rich data sitting there. But the, the basic Yarn UI doesn't really do justice to that type of data. So basically, the timeline service can really unlock the visibility into this rich data that uh, you just actually have there. So that's why it's very important. Uh, and the second thing is you can also build tools like chargeback. Uh, if you're running a multi-tenant cluster, then you want to be able to attribute a certain cost to certain users. User A used, say, 10% of the clusters during this time frame. User B used, say, 50% of uh, your cluster cost. You want to be able to sort of attribute it back to uh, the right users, and you can build tools like you know chargeback and whatnot. And a third interesting use case is actually something like uh, finding a problem node. Uh, you, you earlier heard the talk from you know the Facebook person that um, if a node is being very very slow, sometimes it takes a lot of manual effort to find them, right? But with uh, something like timeline service, what you can do is basically you can quickly see which node is losing, for example, speculative execution. Um, you can easily build tools like that. So if node B is consistently losing speculative execution uh, throughout some hour period, then you know that there's something definitely up with that node. And you can quickly mark that node down or blacklist it in that manner and take it out of circulation. And then you can actually have a much healthier cluster and things like that. So node level visibility, kind of analytical visibility into a complex tag of jobs and also being able to build like historical trending. All these things become possible with data coming from timeline service. So it's basically an enabler feature that we, uh, we have in Yarn. 
Um, let me go talk to a little bit about the history of Thailand service. Back. So Yarn actually built a version one of Timeline Service um, a while ago. And it gained some amount of adoption with like test community and the Hive community and whatnot. And it kept improving uh, the performance and scalability of the Timeline Service. But it, it is still facing some fundamental challenges. And they can be described in ma two major things. One is basically scalability and reliability challenges. So Timeline Service V1 actually uses uh, level DB as a backend storage. And as such, you basically had a single instance storage. And you can easily imagine why that's not going to be able to serve any decent sized cluster. Because the moment you fill up that single node, then you're done. So that wasn't really very scalable in that sense. And also, you had a single instance of the timeline reader and writer through which all reads and writes go through. And that actually became a really big sort of a scalability bottleneck because you're at the mercy of that single node really scaling. So this really didn't really scale beyond a few node cluster type of thing. So we quickly realized that something has to be solved there. And that's actually where HBase comes in. And the second thing is about the usability. Um, we really wanted to build uh, a timeline service based on the notion of a flow. And I touched upon things like Hive or Pig or Scalding and things like that. Woozy is another good example. Um, users rarely think, users don't really think about individual Yarn applications as their unit of work. They usually think of their Scalding applications or their Hive queries and their uh, Pig and things like that. They usually spawn multiple jobs, sometimes some of them even concurrently. So you really want to have an understanding at that level, which is really a higher level than individual Yarn applications. And we wanted to model that as a Yarn flow. And we actually are surfacing that in the timeline service next, uh, next generation. So to quickly summarize um, the difference between V1 and V2. Uh, instead of a single re reader writer, uh, we moved to a distributed writer and a distributed writer architecture. Uh, moving from a single local level DB storage, we are using an HBase, much more scalable storage there. And we have an enhanced entity model that's using the notion of a flow. Uh, we also provide a certain amount of automated metrics aggregation so that if your individual Yarn applications have certain metric values, we actually automatically aggregate them up to a flow level, so you don't have to do that math yourself. So that's actually provided out of the box. Uh, we also provide a fairly rich set of REST API. Um, just for historical background, all this is actually based on um, Twitter's uh, previous open source project called HRaven. Uh, we actually have this thing called HRaven that actually uses HBase as a backend, and it accomplishes a lot of these things. Um, but it was actually still focused on the map reduce, but we are kind of um, expanding it to handle all kinds of different frameworks with the timeline service v2. It's basically, um, this is really rehashing the architecture. So this is a, the architecture at a very high level um, with a single Yarn application right next to the Yarn application master. We have what we call the um, the collector. The collector is basically you can think of it as a kind of write proxy. So if you have a data coming for a particular Yarn application, they all funnel through the application master, and the application actually send that data over to the timeline collector. And the timeline collector is basically your HBase client. Um, this actually handles that write coming from the AM and send it over to the storage. Storage, in this case, is um, HBase. And all the metrics that are emanating from all kinds of different nodes, they all flow through the single instance of timeline collector uh, for each application. So we have basically as many timeline collectors as a number of uh, live applications that are running in the cluster at that point. And the resource manager itself also has its own dedicated timeline collector, because it can emit tons of interesting things also to the storage, things like 
application lifecycle events and all the things that can be written directly by the resource manager. And we also have a bank of timeline readers that are dedicated to serving uh, the queries, the REST queries against the storage. So this is basically the overall read and write flow. And one key point here is that we really strive to optimize this architecture uh, for writes, because the write is basically going to be the key issue here, especially if you have a fairly large size cluster, because the volume of data is actually really tremendous. We really wanted to be able to have a high throughput write happening with the cluster. Uh, reads are, of course, very important, but uh, we are trying to optimize writes first, but then we try to accommodate reads as much as possible to the extent we can. Okay, let me briefly touch on the notion of the flow. Um, as I said earlier, a flow is really a group of Yarn applications that, that are really launched by a user as part of a single logical application. And we talked about things like Uzi or Scalding or Pig and those things. And there are certain attributes that you can associate with a flow. Um, there's usually a name for it. That's usually your application name. Sometimes it can be a pick script name or some kind of unique hash of that particular application you, you wrote. And then there's also a notion of the run ID. So what is a run ID of a flow? Um, you can write the same flow, but you can run them multiple times. I mean, you can just think of it as a pick script. You wrote a pick script once, but in, most likely you run the pick script multiple times. So we want to associate an ID for those individual runs, and that's what the run ID is for. And then you can also optionally associate something called a version. So version is nothing but a way to distinguish different versions or different sort of iterations of the particular um, flow, whether it's pig or something else. So we have these attributes that are associated with the flow, and they're basically modeled in a hierarchical manner. If you look at um, uh, the diagram on the, on the right, you'll see basically there's a flow entity, timeline entity. Underneath it, there's a flow run entities, and they actually are now parents of Yarn application entities, and your Yarn app attempt, and your container entities, and so on. So this is actually how we modeled uh, these entities within the timeline service. Let me skip this one. OK, so let me go into probably the more interesting part, you know, where HBase comes in. Um, so we chose HBase because we believe that HBase is you know, truly a scalable backend for this. And we found that that is probably the best match for the problem we are trying to solve here. And we really utilized the row key structure. So we basically uh, crafted the row keys so that it enables very efficient writes to the storage. And the one thing that we really try to do is basically uh, we never read when we write. So basically, we do a total readless write so that um, any write or any update activity happens without any reads happening whatsoever. So everything is basically just pure writes happening. And for the read cases, uh, we use basically HBase filters very aggressively. And we do a filter pushdowns really aggressively to serve um, all the major uh, read REST endpoints. We also use um, HBase coprocessors um, in a pretty interesting manner. And actually, we're going to go into a little more details about this. Uh, we talked about the aggregation. If your Yarn application has a certain metrics value, we want to be able to aggregate those values up to your flow um, out of the box and automatically for you. And that's actually where we use the uh, coprocessor to do this aggregation um, for you. And we also use a cell tags to do a num number of interesting things. And, and also, Yup is going to talk about that a little bit. And we also use a cell timestamps uh, during the put um, in an interesting manner. OK, let me describe some of the tables that we have in HBase for timeline service. Um, I mean, these should match pretty well with the entities that we talked about. There's a flow run table. 
there's an application table, and there's a generic entity table where the bulk of the data is going to be sitting in, and there's a flow activity table, and there's an application to flow table. So let's talk about the flow, flow run table. So we talked about the flow run earlier, right? Basically, there's a flow. Um, each actualization of the flow is a flow run, a single row in the flow run table. And the row key looks like this. So it starts with a cluster, because we want this HBase um, storage to be multi-tenant or multi-cluster, really. So it starts with a cluster ID, uh, and then username, and then the flow name, and then basically the flow run ID. But we actually invert this number so that if we actually scan the table, we actually grab the most recent run of the particular flow rather than the other way around, because that's actually what users are more interested in. So we store the rows in this manner. And we enable the coprocessor to handle the aggregation. An application table is the next one. And it looks pretty similar. It follows a similar structure here, too. Cluster ID, username, flow name, and flow run ID, and followed by the application ID. This table hosts all the YARN applications that ever ran for the particular cluster. Similarly, the entity table, uh, you probably get this now. Um, the order is a little bit different here. A username, cluster ID, flow, uh, flow run ID, um, application ID, and then entity type. It can be things like Yarn container, Yarn app attempt, and things like that. Or it can be frame, sp framework specific things like your map reduce job and things like that too. And the entity ID, finally. And why did we have the user and the cluster inverted over here? And that is mostly for the sort of the splitting concern. Because this table is by far the biggest table that we're going to create in the Thailand service. So we wanted to have a fairly uh, partitioned uh, scheme for this particular table. And if we started with the cluster ID, the number of clusters is usually much, much smaller than the number of users that you would support. So we wanted to have well, we wanted to have some diversity. That's why we are starting with the user. And that way, we can actually split them into multiple regions more easily. So that's why there's a little bit of inversion happening with the row key. And the flow activity table. So the flow activity table is basically um, a daily snapshot, if you will. So it's going to take a look at the activities happening in the cluster. And it's going to figure out what uh, flows ran for the particular day and give you a kind of a daily snapshot or daily summary of the activities that are happening in the particular cluster. And this will serve as the base table for the new Yarn uh, RM UI. So if you look at the RM UI today, you have the list of running Yarn applications in the first page, right? Um, we are actually envisioning evolving the page so that instead of having individual Yarn applications, you actually see individual flows that are running. And you can tweak it open, and you'll see the applications that are running as part of that flows, and so on and so forth. So this is there's a new reimagined version 2 of the Yarn UI. App to flow table is basically an auxiliary table that maps an application to a flow so that we can do a very efficient lookup for certain cases. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to you to go into a little more detail about the aggregation. All right, thanks, Sunjin. So, this um, a couple of weeks ago, I volunteered Sunjin to do this presentation, and then this morning, he volunteered me to do this part. So, I try to do it justice. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our co-processor and how we use them in cell tags. If you have any questions, just you know, raise your hand and, and ask me as we go along. And maybe first a question: How many people have used a co-processor before? All right, so a bunch of people are familiar with it. All right, so maybe a, a little bit of a Description first of what we're, what we're aggregating. There's two sorts of things uh, that we're aggregating, or maybe three. There's an application level aggregation that we're leaving up to the application. So those are things like, um, if you think about a MapReduce job, all of the different containers and the HFS bytes read or the number of records processed by each mapper, for example. That rolls up into the application itself. That we're leaving to the application itself. Then there's the flow run uh, aggregation. That's the part we talked about where the Hive query has 10 MapReduce jobs or 10 yarn applications. We want to roll that up. That specifically will go into detail. 
that, that is not automatically covered by Yarn yet. So that's something we have to do something different for. And then the third part is what we call offline aggregation, um, that we felt that we don't have to do on the fly as things go. So the, the, the middle case where we're saying a flow run, we really want to have a uh, resource manager UI where you can see all of the running applications, and you want to be able to see all those things rolled up into the flow. So you see my Hive query and all of the bytes read across all of the Yarn applications that have run. So that needed to really be real time. The, the cases of uh, ro rolling up to a user or rolling up to a queue or other kind of dimensions, we said that doesn't have to happen you know, directly within the, you know, a few seconds latency. That can happen a little bit later. And for that, we'll use an offline aggregation mechanism. Um, we've discussed to use Phoenix tables for that. Um, we're not going to go into super much detail on this presentation for that. So another motivator why we needed to use code processors, because we know that you know, using code processors, it has sharp edges. So we've been, we've been warned. And one of the reasons why we're still going for this is that um, we have a fairly high write load. So particularly in our Twitter case, um, we have a system called HRAVEN that currently takes the entire history file after a job is complete and then rolls it into HBase and splits the keys out. So that works fairly well. And you know, overall, over time, we've amassed tens of billions of records of tasks that have run. But now if you want to do this live, you know, some of our larger clusters are 10,000 nodes. So we launch about 4,000 containers per second. If each of these, if you just record the containers and we record about 100 or 200 metrics each, you get a very, very large number of writes happening all at the same time. So if we want to all roll these up, and every application then has to first read the state of the aggregation of the, of the total sum, what the current sum is, and then try to write it back and then have to deal with race conditions to do compare and stores that would uh, not be greatly performant and ends up introducing a read path while you're writing. So what we really wanted to do is to do a readless write. So this was based uh, and inspired by an idea that Gary Hemling had built earlier on the readless um, summation where you can just you know, write increments, the readless increments. We're doing something similar, but maybe slightly more complicated. So this picture shows sort of what's going on here. There's a lot of boxes on this, but the way you read this is there, the, the top two rows are two different applications over time. It reads from left to right, so the time sums go from the left to the right. And then the rows underneath there are the cells as they're written in age base in memory, in the mem store. And underneath there in white is what you get when you do an actual read from that particular column. In, in this particular example, I'm showing a summation. But uh, for our aggregation, we also do minimums and maximums. Uh, for the averages, we've decided to just punt that back to the user and say, you just store a sum and, and a count. So in time one, you can see that there's different applications. So the, the, the blue application uh, starts out first. At T1, it writes a sum of three. So imagine the uh, number of records read by mappers in that application or the number of HTTPS bytes. So that's fine. There's a normal put into HBase. It's stored there. And if you try to read it, you still get three back. So, so far, so good. You know, next time you get a new value seven, we write the next cell. So here's something where something interesting happens. We write the same cell back, but now with two different cell tags. So both cells are going to be um, in memory. So not only are we writing to the application table itself on the top, but we're also writing to the flow table now. And we're storing multiple values. So now we're trading off space for not having to do a read. What the coprocessor now at this point does, if you try to read, it just simply looks at the time order of the same um, cells, and it says, I'm going to return the latest value written. So since there's only one application at this moment, it's fairly easy. We had a 3 and a 7. 7 came in later. The value you're returning for the whole flow, uh, for the whole flow run in this particular case, is 7. Now at T3, something interesting happens. We start a second application, B. It comes in and it writes its um, metric for the, same, uh, for the same column here, and it says, I have a value of 13. So now we have stored the, the values 3, 7, and 13 stored behind one another. The coprocessor comes in and says, I'm taking the latest value for each application. So it takes the 13 from application B, the 7 from application A, and it discards the number 3 from A because that's a later value. And fortunately, the coprocessors hand those values to us in order, so we know that as we've seen an application before, we can just drop the rest and not iterate it through that anymore. So we sum those things up together. If you ask and you query at that point in time, the answer will be back 20. But 20 is not stored anywhere at this moment. That's just a virtual value. So as we go along, uh, you can see that there's more and more values written. So now you know, at T4, another value is written. It's going to be the latest again. You read it out. You sum it up. So, so far, so good. Now, 
This sounds great in that you don't have to read back, so you're just doing two writes, one to your application table and one to the flow run table, but clearly we're building up more and more and more values. So this starts becoming expensive. The good thing is that in HBase, we have a flush mechanism, so at the time HBase ends up flushing these values down to disk, we do not have to write every single value. So at that point, what we do is we decide to just only keep the latest value that we have for, for every application. So we keep only the uh, 17 and the 15. So again, if you do a read at that point in time, we still return you 30. So that's where the, where the flush happens. Um, this value is also useful at the same time so that if an application ends up crashing and has to reread, it can still go back in and reread what the latest value was. So now we've served two, pro two purposes. We can go um, back in time and, and do uh, restarts and reread these counters, and we can um, roll them up on the fly. So now we've seen another example where on at T6, there's another value written for application B. Those are stored. Uh, the values are returned. And these counters, uh, just like with most counters in, in Hadoop, they don't have to necessarily always increase. I just chose increasing values and prime numbers because we were being geeky when we put the slide together. This slide shows multiple steps in the same, but now what's, what you can see is as there's a dark outline around an application, that indicates the final value. So that indicates that the application is done, and it says, I'm done with this. This is the last value I'm writing. So, in T7, you can see that the value is written for 23 for application A. It's written. And initially, nothing new happens. We'll see that in a little bit later that we, we handle this, this uh, in a slightly different case. So at the T8 later, uh, another flush happens. And we keep the latest value for each application. You do a read. You still get the, the, the correct sum back together. So, so far, so good here. On T09, I'm introducing a third application that now starts. The third value is, is, is stored. You know, the, the same mechanism happens again here. At uh, time 10, the second application finishes. So now application A and B have finished. We can again do a flush. We keep the latest value of each. But now in a little bit later, what can happen is if a compaction happens, now we can do something special. So now later on, what we want to do is um, up to maybe a day later, because we want to account for the fact that there's some failure and some rights might be buffered on the client. So we're going to keep values around for a day, or you know, configure in this case. But our, our current thinking is to configure that to default to a day. So now what we do is up to a day, we keep the latest value for that application around. So if any further writes come back, they will be sorted in behind the value that came in for the last value. So we still handle that case correctly, and it's good. But we don't want to keep that around forever. So at some point, what happens after a day, compaction happens. And at that point, we can decide, OK, we're going to shed the values that we had originally stored for A and B. And now we're going to just store the sum of those two together first as a flow run value that's slightly different, so that I have a slightly different cell tag. And then we still keep the, the live values for the other applications around. So that's what's happening uh, in, in the gray cell in the last column here. There's one a little interesting bit we have here. I don't know if you recall the, the row key structure that we had. The row key structure for this is that the cluster is prefixed. And we envision an environment where we have multiple clusters in different data centers. And we picture an environment where we have one HBase cluster um, per data center to record from all the clusters in the data center, and then multiple data centers doing master-to-master -master replication. So now the one tricky bit is here that if you end up doing compaction in multiple data centers at the same time on different, um, different times, uh, on the same uh, structure, you may end up getting the wrong answer. So what we're going to decide to do there is to make sure that we do compaction only in the quote-unquote home uh, cluster, so only in the designated cluster for that the designated HBase cluster for the corresponding yarn cluster where we do the compaction for those particular rows. And then you know, we don't do compaction on the same rows at the same time. Okay, let me just finish up. We have uh, four minutes. So I'm going to have to go through them pretty quickly. Um, so we have a pretty standard REST style reader API that we support. I'm not going to go too much uh, detail into this one. but. Um, again, I'd like to mention that we're using the HPS filters very aggressively and extensively. So they actually push them down, and we try to return as minimal data as possible coming from the HPS. Um, I'll have to skip this one. This is how it will set up the timeline service. Um, this is probably not of very big interest. Um, so let's talk about the current status. We already merged this to trunk, so it's actually now part of um, Hadoop 3.0. Um, so it's merged. 
Um, it has basically the complete end-to-end -end flow we described that's actually all now sitting in the trunk of Hadoop. But we're still working on this because there's still a lot of uh, sub features that we still need to implement. And this is where sort of you guys come in. Um, I mean, these are the, basically this is a laundry list of things that we are doing right now in integration with uh, new Yarn UI. Uh, we want to integrate with more frameworks. Uh, test guys are already working hard on this. Um, we want to freeze the API and storage schema. Uh, security is a really big concern. Uh, we also want to accept, uh, right now, the collector is actually an auxiliary service to the Yarn node manager. But there are many reasons that we want to actually pull it out of there, because it can impact the node managers. We want to actually make it at least a separate daemon, but hopefully more of a kind of special Yarn container so that they can be really isolated, and we can also reason about th their costs and whatnot. So that work is coming. Uh, we, also, we are also building uh, some of our fault tolerance. For example, what happens if HBase cluster is down or HBase cluster is tr struggling to keep up? Then we don't want to blow all the client clusters like left and right, right? So we need to have some kind of a fault tolerance built in. So we actually we, we are working on that. We actually talked with a stack about this briefly. Um, and um, of course, we want to make it more production ready and migration ready, and we want to declare a beta on this feature. Um, there are a few things I'd like to talk about, um, probably where you guys can help us. Um, one interesting thing is this now represents an interesting dependency inversion. Um, this is Yarn, right? Now Yarn finally depends on HBase. And that is sort of the other way around. HBase depend, depend, depends on still H, HDFS. But we found out that H, HBase actually has a kind of an interesting dependency on Yarn. It actually depends on even map reduce to a certain extent. So now we have a bit of an interesting circular dependency happening as part of this. And actually, Cloudera folks ran, ran into this when they tried to build it with um, HBase 2.0. So there are a number of things we are doing to try to sort of disentangle this sort of circular dependency. Circular dependency is one problem. And the second problem is also diamond dependency. What do I mean by that? Um, this is Yarn 3.0 feature. And we depend on HBase 1.13 as of today. But HBase 1.13 depends on Hadoop 2.52. So we have a bit of a bind here. So we really have to separate these things and do something really um, interesting with a Maven Palms to really separate these two things. So I mean, these are really interesting, potentially a bit of a landmine, if you will. But we need to sort this out. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is also the coprocessor. So right now, we are using actually a full global coprocessor for this uh, flow run coprocessor. But that's not an ideal place to be in. We really want this to be a dynamic table coprocessor. But there's actually one kind of a stumbling block for this, because our class happens to be Org Apache Hadoop. And in the dynamic coprocessor, basically, that brings in, and basically, our coprocessor is considered a system class or e exam class. So we don't get kind of class path isolation for our coprocessor. So that's something that we also need to resolve. And we, we want to be in a, a dynamic coprocessor. And I think there are a couple other things. Let me pull up my notes. Oh, yes. Uh, we also wanted to have a robust single node configuration for the HBase storage. Because coming from Yarn side, there are some customers and people that are not 100% comfortable with setting up HBase as a requirement to having um, the timeline service. For them, we want to present a very you know, no frills, simple push button type of HBase setup uh, so that, that they don't really have like entry barrier to this. And that's very important. So we'd like to figure out a useful kind of a single node HBase setup that still writes to HDFS so that they don't really have to sort of have a big fear of going into this feature. And then I think the last thing is really the, so the full tolerance that we want to build around the buffered mutator. Because we are using the buffered mutator. And we want to build the full tolerance actually even at the HBase level so that we can just leverage it instead of building one on our own. Yep. So I think we're a little bit over time. So if you, you know, we could talk about this for hours more. We can do that over a beer maybe. So you, know, you can find us in the back of the room later.